Hello, welcome back to Stories from the Low Season. This is episode seven, which features a story by Rebecca Hanover Kurzweil. I'm Alex Kemp. I'm Jeffrey from Poolside. So what is this project that we're doing here? Well, Alex, you reached out to a bunch of fiction writers or general creative writers to write uh, narrative type stories based around or inspired by the songs from the album Low Season that we wrote together a couple years ago, pre-pandemic. That's exactly it. Nailed it. Crushing. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, in this case, uh, my wife and one of the producers on the show, Winnie Kemp, reached out to her bestie, uh, an amazing writer, Rebecca Hanover Kurzweil, also a New York Times bestselling author of The Similars. No big deal. And she came back with a story that, to me, really nails what I love about Poolside the most, which is that it's super fun music that has this layer to it that that is a little bittersweet, is a little darker, and it makes the the fun you feel from the music feel earned. Yeah, that's well said. And I think for Kind of Lovely, what I had in mind when I was involved in the writing was it's kind of like where you see someone, you have like a crush, or you have this little kind of lovely moment with someone, but you don't want to have any more. You're like, because you don't want to ruin it. Like... You know, like a barista and you, you kind of like have a nice little moment, but you're like, I actually don't want to know them any more than just this exchange. Right, it's all downhill from yeah, there. Yeah, because like that moment will be gone. And, you know, that's kind of what I had in mind, which fits what you're saying, where it's not just this like kind of lovely literal sense, like a praise for someone. It's, it's like this kind of lovely moment that you want to keep fleeting instead of, having reality rear its ugly head. That's so cool, and I think it relates in this story so well because it's really, this story is about a relationship that is uh, long-standing and kind of what happens if you hold on to that moment, go to the next level, it does get more difficult. Right, things get real. A little trickier. (laughs) So, enough said, this is Different If She Tried, written by Rebecca Hanover Kurzweil, performed by Joy Lofton, with the music of Poolside, the song is Kinda Lovely. I hope you enjoy it. Jess wasn't sure what she was doing here. Sure, she knew why she was here. Her family had been invited to this pool party by another couple at the school. Sam and Laura or something. Or maybe it was Lauren. Like that woman, Lauren Bush, who had married Ralph Lauren's son David and was now Lauren Bush Lauren. Was it Laura? Lauren, Lauren. Jess wasn't quite sure. Was she sure of anything? It was one of those Saturday afternoons in May that would have dragged on at home relentlessly, her kids tugging at the belt of her cardigan, begging her to play Legos or draw with them or something, anything that she knew she should want to do but decisively didn't. It's not that she hated Legos or drawing or whatever. She used to like those things. It was the having to do it so often and not on her timetable that she pointedly disliked. Why couldn't her kids ever wait for her to be ready to get down on the floor with them? Once she'd drunk her coffee and showered and checked her Instagram and put on clothes and washed her face and teeth, generally become a human, it was baffling. So she and Dan had accepted the invitation to this party because it meant A, unlimited swimming for the kids, which meant B, less tugging at her cardigan, and C, guaranteed physical activity 
which meant she wouldn't have to run them like dogs later at the playground or throw them outside in a fit of rage once they'd inevitably picked a fight with each other over a stupid toy no one actually cared about. It was much better to come here, where Max and Asher could splash and scream and play, than to stay home, even though Jess the homebody would have preferred that in an alternate universe version of her life. Though what was the point of imagining alternate universes? Even if they existed, she was stuck in this one. Jess sat on the only available lounge chair, her bare, unpedicured feet tucked under her. She never got a pedicure except for special occasions, though she noted unhappily that every other mother here seemed to have a fresh one, and she wondered why or if she was the only woman on the planet, or at least in LA, who felt her heart rate accelerate the moment she sat in one of those massage chairs at the nail salon. It wasn't the chemicals, even though know, the smells didn't help. It was the agonizing wait while a woman you didn't know poked and prodded you and the increasing panic she felt that she'd ruin the whole thing the second she put her shoes on or drove home. Jess avoided nail salons like most people avoided the dentist, but she was secretly embarrassed that she couldn't get her act together enough to like them, like a normal person in her late 30s. Unfortunately, Jess had a second secret shame, besides her fear of Manny Petties. She hated pools. This one was beautiful. Not one of those cheesy monstrosities with a wiggly brick edge, but a proper, modern infinity pool. Sam and Laura, or Lauren, were wealthy. That was obvious. Their house was stunning, straight out of Dwell magazine. But Jess wasn't envious. She would never have a pool at her house. Too dangerous. And now that her family was here for the afternoon, there was no possible way for her to relax. Not with her kids bobbing and floating all over that damn pool. Just tried, repeatedly, not to read all the People magazine tragedy porn that populated her Facebook news feed, but she couldn't help herself. She knew she had to watch her kids like a hawk every second they were in the water. And if that meant she couldn't even get up to pee, then she wouldn't. It went beyond her kids, too. Jess felt responsible for every child in the pool. She was like some kind of voluntary, unofficial suburban lifeguard, scanning her eyes over the surface like she'd seen lifeguards do in movies. She'd had no formal training. Dan was nowhere to be found. He was likely in the throes of a dynamic discussion about sustainable t-shirt brands with another dad, downing a beer and completely unaware that his wife was providing free life-saving services to the entire party. There were seven kids in all, her two boys, three girls, and two other boys. And Jess noted that most of the parents seemed vaguely uninterested in her standard of vigilance as though they somehow knew she'd taken on the role of protector and that gave them permission to relax and drink and forget about their kids altogether. This is why Jess hated pools. She couldn't relax at them, not at all. This entire afternoon spent burning away in the sun. Was it time to reapply the SPF? It was for the benefit of everyone else in her family, not her. But even if she tried to explain this to Dan, he would have told her she was being crazy and probably even ungrateful. Why couldn't she chill out at a pool party like everyone else? Was she incapable of relaxation? Maybe she was. Which brought Jess back to the question of why she'd said yes to the invitation and whether it had been worth it. Could she turn her brain off? It seemed impossible. Recently, she'd read that some people existed in the world without an ongoing internal monologue, and she was so insanely jealous and angry to read those words that she'd slammed her laptop shut, almost cracking the screen in the process. Her whole life was an internal monologue. It was distressing to learn that some people were spared that burden, and she blamed her parents for this, but then she felt guilty about it because they were in their 80s and well-meaning and they'd raised her well. Maybe it wasn't even their fault. Maybe it was just her. Could Jess be different if she tried? Could she be like that mom over there, 
Karen, or maybe it was Kara, the one who seemed so effortlessly calm and comfortable in her maxi caftan, discussing the pros of her vegan lifestyle with another mom who was defending her meat-eating choices in an increasingly agitated manner. Of course, Jess couldn't. She was hardwired this way. She stood up abruptly, scanning the water. Max had taken a dive and hadn't come up for air yet. Jess felt her breathing grow shallow and was poised to leap in after him when he emerged in mere moments, laughing and shaking his wet hair like a dog, grinning like an idiot, or an eight-year-old boy enjoying being in the water, experiencing a carefree summer day like Jess hadn't in years. She sank back down onto her lounge chair as her heart slowed its rhythm. He was fine. Everyone was fine. Did they even need her? Did they even see her? No one had even acknowledged that she'd almost prevented a near tragedy. But that was the thing about motherhood, the real crux of it. It was a completely thankless job. Everyone said that, everyone knew it. But not like Jess did. She knew it. What if, and this was an insane thing to think, but Jess's thoughts ranged from the practical lunches to the completely bizarre. What if she was one of those babies left at a fire station and her parents had lied to her her whole life? So nothing surprised her much. What if she just left? She'd have to inform her husband, of course. She'd never leave this pool without complete assurance that her children wouldn't drown or any of the others. She wouldn't abandon them either. It wasn't their fault their parents were negligent. But what if she did? Walk over to Dan, tap him on the shoulder, and let him know not to expect her back tonight. Or ever. No, that was really insane. She loved her family. They were absurdly precious to her. So precious, she rarely took an eye off them. She was obsessed with untwisting car seat straps, scanning every room for choking hazards, fastening swim floaties, and teaching her children about the dangers of avalanches. She absolutely couldn't bear the thought of losing any of them, ever. She felt a choking sensation in her throat, even imagining them being gone. Sweet Max, with his intense questions from morning till night. Fierce Asher, with those blue eyes that surveyed her like she'd made the world with her bare hands. And yet, there was something utterly tantalizing about the idea of walking away from this pool and never looking back. At least for a day or two. Maybe a week. A month. No, a month was lunacy. But what if she did go? Picked up and left? Dan wouldn't divorce her. He'd laugh it off as a midlife crisis and wouldn't even take it seriously, which burned a little, thinking about how unseriously he'd consider it. He'd be mystified, maybe a little hurt, but then he'd be fine. He would have to pick up the slack while she was gone which he was completely unqualified to do. Being the product manager of an artisanal beer company would not prepare him to do laundry or make snacks or pack for field trips. The children might go to school wearing athletic shoes and no socks. The shoes would smell. She'd have to wash them or buy some of that odor spray. But maybe they'd learn something. It would ultimately be good for them if she left, Jess thought. Isn't grit what the colleges looked for these days? Teens who knew how to tie their shoes and boil water. The kids would be all right, Jess thought. Which meant the only question left was where? Where would Jess, where could Jess possibly go? Not the hospital. She was aware of the cliche of moms dreaming of contracting a flu just nasty enough to buy them a few days off but not serious enough to kill them. No one wished for that. A bookstore. Jess loved books, or she had in the past anyway. 
She rarely read anymore, except for parenting articles that made her furious with rage, or CNN headlines that caused her to sob with the utter pointlessness of it all. She missed reading for pleasure. She wanted to walk through the aisles of a local Barnes and Noble and touch the books, really touch them, like she used to before she had kids. She wanted to buy a stack of novels about Paris and India and sit at a dirty cafe table with a paper cup of lukewarm coffee and read without looking at the time. Not once. Jess, her inner voice berated her. What's wrong with you? Is that what you'd do if you walked away from it all? Hit up your local Barnes and Noble? Jess wasn't sure. It was simply the first place that had popped into her mind. At least it hadn't been Whole Foods. If it had been Mary Ellen, it would have been Whole Foods. Mary Ellen always had Whole Foods on the brain. But maybe her inner voice had a point. Maybe what she really wanted was something far more complex and titillating and visceral and alive. Just wondered if she wanted clubs and glasses of whiskey with one giant ice cube and dancing and sweaty bodies and the pulse of the music and the thrill of not knowing where she might go next. Maybe she wanted freedom and insanely good food. And maybe she even wanted drugs. She wasn't sure she'd never tried them. Maybe she wanted Burning Man or Coachella. Or maybe she wanted Bali. But none of that seemed right. None of that sounded worth leaving her family for. And what would happen to them without her? Besides the smelly shoes, that is. Emotionally, what would become of them? Max would never admit it, but he craved her cuddles, her kisses. Asher would wander the halls of their quiet home asking where mommy was, like a puppy with his tail between his legs. She'd read stories to him every night since he was born, give or take a few nights away for dinners and preschool fundraisers and that trip to Michigan for her aunt's funeral. The boys would be so sad without her. She wasn't as sure about Dan. Did he really need her? Or did he simply need someone like her to check the numerous boxes of their busy lives? Mother, chauffeur, amateur chef, homework supervisor, athletic gear purchaser. Dan didn't know how to do any of those things. He'd never bought soccer socks. Jess's eyes filled with tears as she considered how much her boys would miss her. Or would they? Maybe Dan would serve them pizza for breakfast and let them buy glazed donuts. Maybe they wouldn't miss her at all. Now Jess cried about that. Her crying was threefold, because she also cried about the simple reality that there truly was nowhere for her to go beyond the bookstore. And that hardly counted. Where was her sense of adventure? Could she not even imagine a more interesting life for herself? She was 38 years old, and she worried that this was it her one precious life, and she was hardly able to enjoy it. She wasn't sure the last time she had enjoyed it, any of it. The evenings watching Breaking Bad and the days spent dropping her kids off on curbs for school, the cooking and the cleaning that seemed to define her essence, because for what other purpose did she exist besides supervising and managing everyone else? What was her point? If a million women could do exactly what she did, and they did, every day, all around her, what was keeping her from throwing herself into the metaphorical abyss? Or into this pool? No, she wouldn't go in the pool. No matter what happened, she absolutely would steer clear of the pool. She hated pools, after all. And she reminded herself, she hadn't had a bikini wax. The cover-up simply wouldn't, simply couldn't come off. Jess stood up. She called at Max and Asher to get out of the water. Then she yelled it when it was clear they weren't listening. 
they never did. Finally, when Jess threatened them with consequences, loss of dessert, loss of iPads, they responded, confused. Why did mommy want them to stop swimming? Because, she said firmly, sounding more confident than she had in years. Because I said so. Jess noticed Max shoot his brother a look. The two boys shrugged and dragged their wiry little bodies from the water, asking more questions. Why did they have to get out? Why couldn't they keep swimming? Could they have juice? Where was daddy? Jess didn't answer any of those questions. She grabbed each boy by his forearm and marched them over to where she imagined Dan to be. There he was, talking to that other father, just like she thought. When she called Dan's name across the patio, he raised an eyebrow. Was something wrong? Were the boys okay? No, nothing was wrong, she heard herself say, except everything. I need you to watch the kids, she barked, as though through a wind tunnel. Jess didn't know why, but she felt like if she didn't do something, anything right now, she might not matter ever again. Had she ever mattered? She wasn't sure. Her heart pounded with the urgency of it all. She briefly surveyed herself, her fingers pinching the tender flesh of her boy's arms, her precious boys. She noted her willowy cover-up, which did exactly what it purported, covering the stretch marks she was too cowardly to surgery away, the ingrown hairs, the thighs that shook in spite of years spent in Pilates classes, not to mention the money drained, so much money, and for what? the breasts that sagged and would never be what they once were. Dan claimed he didn't care if they were perky, but didn't he? She wondered. Are you okay? Jess? Dan asked. He didn't seem overly worried. And why should he be? She never faltered, never wavered, with the exception of that one time when she was too tired to cook dinner after giving birth. She'd never failed them. And when he felt the need to jet to Fiji to catch some waves, she barely blinked. It was her turn, wasn't it? I'm going, was all she could say. She kissed each boy firmly on the cheek, tightened their swim floaties, and walked back to her lounge chair where her purse was waiting for her. She felt her hands shake as she dug in her bag for her iPhone. She would call a lift. She couldn't take the car. Dan would need it. It had the car seats, didn't it? Never mind, the boys could die without their car seats. Dan could get arrested if he drove the boys without them. The last thing they needed was an absentee mother and a father in prison. She opened up the Lyft app and stared at the tiny where-to box that seemed to mock her with its infiniteness and its sarcasm. Where to? Jess really wasn't sure. Oh, mm -hmm.